John Paul. I'm here to show you the start of this meal, which is putting the beans into the crock pot. These are pinto beans. Now I'm doing this and not Bev because this is quite early in the morning. So it's always my job to put the beans on. So quite a simple affair. Take it to the tap. Put water in so the water covers the beans by about two inch. Then simply put that pot with the beans and the water, no salt or anything like that, just beans and water, into the crock pot. Da -da -da, look at that. Clever stuff. And then just simply put the lid on, switch it on. And it's that simple. So this is JP. You don't normally see me, but there you go. As you can see, there's a good reason why you don't normally see me, but look at that belly. See you all later. Welcome back to Bevy's Kitchen. It's been a few days. I was taking some time off resting. Even today, I'm not feeling all that swift, but I thought, F you to the fibro, and I'm going to come here and do a video for y'all. Now you know how you see in magazines and you see on cooking shows on TV where they're telling you that they're going to show you how to cook cheap. Well, I got news for you. Five pound or five dollar a head to me ain't cheap. I know how to cook real cheap. Why do I, why do I know how to cook real cheap? Because we've been poor. And everybody's probably going to get to that point in their lives. And I want to show you how not only you can survive when you get po, and I mean po, <laughs> or as we would say poor, but I want to show you how to eat well. Today we're having kind of a, I guess you could call it a hillbilly, a mountain style, a deep south mountain meal. And this meal is full of protein full of nutrition, it's damn good for you, and it's damn tasty. But the most important thing about this meal is it's cheap. All right, now earlier you saw a clip of Paul putting a pound or so of pinto beans, and that means weight, and they're also about a pound, a bag usually in the store. When you go look at them, they'll only be a dollar or two, probably still in America, pinto. Dried beans are very cheap. I like the dried beans. Sometimes you can substitute rose cocos over here in the UK, but I think in most big shops now, you should be able to find pinto beans. Pinto beans are beloved in the South. We love them. And we also, you know, the Mexican people where I come from also love them and utilize them quite often in their dishes, serving them on the side a lot of times in refritos or refried beans, which is something else I'm going to teach you how to make soon. But today we're having the pinto beans whole and cooked in my beloved crock pot. Now, Paul put them in with water, plenty of water to cover a couple of inches at least above the beans because they're going to swell up a lot. He put them in there this morning. They're going to cook for about eight or nine hours on low. If you're not a morning person like me, and I'd have had, to, I'd not have had Paul to facilitate earlier action for me, then you could put him on and have him on high for about five and get the same results. We are going to season those beans with cheap things. So they're not going to just be boring ass beans in a pot. They're going to be kick ass beans with some beautiful taste. So besides those beans today, you're going to need a bag of potatoes. Now to show I'm in keeping with the cheap theme, I didn't go for my favorite Maris Pipers today. I went for British white potatoes. Why? Because it cost me a quid. One pound for a big bag of potatoes. I'm going to use all of them because I want to give everybody a generous portion. I've got half of a small head of garlic here. We weren't able to get the garlic, the elephant garlic, you know, the really big garlics about that big around. I like to work with them. They're really easy to work with. And this is about six cloves of garlic, give or take. We're also working with cheap bacon today. You don't have to go out and buy fancy meats and fancy cuts and all that stuff to make the beans taste good. All you need is something like this. 
This is smoked back bacon and it's 350 grams. They were going on a two for three pound sale. We bought two. They stay good a long time, so one went in the fridge and we'll go on my black eyed peas, which I'll also be showing you. They have a very distinctive flavor, a little well of the smoky flavor of the bacon. We're using this whole pack of bacon. No, it's not that much fat. Most of it's lean meat, but that little bit of fat in there that you see, it really contributes a lot of flavor. I've got a package of leeks today. These come trimmed and washed. But still, I trim and wash them again to make sure because leeks are renowned for being gritty. I don't waste a lot of the product though. Some people tell you to cut it off there and all that crap and only use the white parts. No, 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 no. But anyways, this cost about a quid and it's three nice size leeks, which are going to be cooked with my white cabbage. My mother loved white cabbage. It is cheap as hell. This big head of cabbage cost us about 69p. It's weighty. You don't have to get one this big, but I'm serving four people and we're not really eating any meat per se. I mean, yes, there's some meat going in what we consider seasoning for the beans and those beans are going to make a lot of servings. You'll see. We'll have leftovers. But this is a good cabbage. I don't know how much it weighs. It's a good medium sized white cabbage. I like white cabbage. It's cheap, it's easy to clean, it's delicious. I also am going to be using, even though this says beef flavored gravy crystals, these are our onion flavored gravy crystals. I'm not making homemade gravy today because I don't feel like it. You can if you like, but I would recommend chicken or uh, vegetable or uh, onion flavored gravy crystals for this meal. I don't often use the beef crystals. I just consider the original beef crystal gravy to be a bit dark and strong for a lot of my meals, except for beef. This is loved or hated in this country. Loved by many, also hated by many. I didn't know a damn thing about it until I moved here. This is Marmite. It's like a vegetable yeast extract substance. It is pungent and it has a very much flavor. Now, straight up, the lovers of Marmite will eat it. They'll spread it on toast. They'll tell you it's the best shit you've ever had in your life. But it is something that is an acquired taste. However, you can put this in things like gravies and stews and soups and sauces and beans and no one will ever know. And we're not going to tell them, are we? It makes them taste boom. Salt, as you can see, I'm getting to the dredges of my Himalayan pink salt, but that's okay because we bought another one for a pound. Now, the convenience of garlic butter coming in tubs and sachets is a revelation to me because I love garlic and I like butter too. We're making mash today. You've seen me make mash before. Everybody loves mash. The kids love mash. We love mash. Hooray for mash. And I'm just putting this garlic gold Irish cottage kind of like whipped butter in there. It's been whipped up so it's soft and spreadable. I'm putting a couple of knobs of that in with the mash to bring the flavor notches up. And plain old cracked black pepper. I like to freshly crack my black pepper. It's easy nowadays with the, with the machines. Turn it off, please. Okay, um, so we're gonna get started showing you how to prep for this simple and extremely cheap meal in just a mo. By the way, um, we got a Don Beery recipe coming out soon. We, we uh, taped the whole thing and then lost the middle of it somehow. It went into the black hole of tape hood. And we had done it. We had worked all day on that dish because it's quite a labor of love, uh, Don Beery, and, and showing you how to make chashu pork for the Don Beery, which is a Japanese dish. But I'm going to do the middle part. We're going to retape the middle part again, stick it in there, and get it back out to you because I don't want you to miss the opportunity on how to make Don Beery. Also, I have procured coarse ground 
cornmeal, which means I'm going to be showing you people how to make grits. And I've got leftover grits today, and I'm going to be shaping them into patties, and I'm going to be frying them again and going to try to make some like hoe cakes. Not hoe as in slag, but hoe as in, in the garden. They're an old southern tradition, like griddle cakes. So let's get started with the prep work of our hillbilly cowboy meal. See you on the flip side. Okay, here we go. We're going to prep the leeks. Well, looks like I have prepped the leeks. I cut both ends off, and I'm getting ready to clean them. You see me slitting it down the side through the first two or three layers with the knife, hobbling over to the sink. I'm going to get some cool water and I'm going to hold back the layers and just get all the dirt and grit out that you see. Leeks are notorious for this, but it's usually only the first three or so layers that need to be cleaned. So just pull them back and check and use your fingers to wipe around and make sure that everything is off of there and they're nice and clean inside. I had to take a good deal of the green part off of these leeks, but sometimes you don't have to. Now, this is my white cabbage. I'm taking off just the first couple leaves because they tend to get a bit bruised and a bit rubbery, you know, and they're not as crispy and fresh. So I just peel those away. And this is just a plain old cheap white cabbage. You'll find that it's very inexpensive and it's excellent for these kind of recipes and also it's excellent because it's a clean cabbage and doesn't take a lot of work for cleaning it does however take some brute strength to slice through as you can see <laughs> I think I said damn <laughs> I'm cutting around the core as you can see the core is facing upwards and I'm using that as a guide and I'm cutting down beside the core on all four sides. I think I'm enjoying listening to Ladysmith there. It's getting me in a jiggy dancy mood. I love it. Now I'm taking that and I'm slicing it into kind of like ribbons, thin strips. That's how I like to slice my cabbage. If you want to do it in chunks, do it in chunks. But I like the ribbons. I think they're really nice. And they do cook quite easily. They cook well when you've got them sliced thinly like that. And you can just put them in the bowl just like they don't have to take them apart. They're going to fall apart when you go to fry them. I see my buddy Paul is back there, my Sue. I don't know what exactly he's doing. I think he may be making us a cuppa. Peppermint tea for me always and coffee for him only have one cup of coffee a day and I'm still making strips strip 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 and show lots of strips I like lots of edge as you know about me now and I can show you there I'm showing you that the, that's the core you don't want that stuff it's bitter and it's hard so throw all that core part away and just use you can get fairly close to the core, but don't use any of the solid part of the core. Now I'm taking my leeks and I'm just slicing them into discs, my leeks that I cleaned earlier for our cabbage and leek fry up or stir fry or whatever the hell you want to call it. I'm showing you my garlic. I'm going to skin those garlic cloves. There's about six fat ones there because me like a lot of garlic. And I have shown you now, there's the ribbons <laughs> in my tummy soon. And the discs and the garlic minced up small. Now for the next part of this dish, which is our garlicky mash. I'm going to take these cheap basic white potatoes which I paid about a pound for and peel them and I love to use my peeler as you can see I think it's therapeutic and relaxing I'm having a bit of peppermint tea there all my potatoes have been magically peeled while he tried to get away and I generally cut on a really big one like the both sides off and then I cut down the middle of the big slice and then into chunks. 
I don't want to cut, you don't want to cut really big chunks because that's just going to make your potato cook longer. If you're going to mass that, if you're going to mash it all up at the end of the day anyway, why the hell, you know, cook it whole or cook it in big chunks? You want that shit to cook fast. So you cut it into little bite-sized pieces or so. And it's going to, I don't know what the hell I'm listening to here. I guess it's still the Lady Smith. I can't remember the Mambusa, Mambasa. And there they are, all chunked up. <laughs> Chunky chub. Always rinse your potatoes after you peel them to get any peeling bits off, to get the extra starches off, to get any dirt away. There's no point unless they're particularly... I'm eating my own hair here. I'm trying to grow my hair out. I wore a hawk for about nine years, so yeah, it's a bit frustrating when my hair gets in my face. It's actually very frustrating. Not letting him escape. He's getting boiled. Don't worry about it. He's not going to hurt us. Now, this is my bean pot. And my beans have been going for a couple of hours on high. Now, I'm taking my bacon now. A whole pack of it. Yep. And this is smoked back bacon. And it was very cheap. Like I said, I think about two for three quid. And I'm just using my kitchen shears because that's how I roll. And I'm cutting them into little pieces. I'm not being particular about the shape. Um, I'm not wanting it to look pretty. It's going in a slow cooker. It's going in there for flavor. So I don't care what it looks like. And the shears just make it easy for my clumsy butt to cut all that bacon up quickly. If it makes my job easier, I'm going to use it. I'm always looking for ways to make little things easier in the kitchen, especially nowadays with my knees and hips and stuff bugging me so much because I used to stand for hours and hours in there and I can't do it anymore, obviously. So you just keep on snipping away at your bacon if you would like to. You could use a cooked or an uncooked ham hock. You could use, if you're in the south where I'm from, a bit of fat back, a bit of salt pork. And you could use, I suppose, smoked turkey if you have access to it, which sadly I do not. I know some people down south now are using that because it's healthier than pork. I don't know how it rates flavor-wise uh, compared to pork, but pork is a very flavorful meat and bacon is tops in these beans and it's very inexpensive for us to get here so and since we're not having any other meat with this meal and these beans are going to leave us leftovers I figure hey you know the little bit of fat on that bacon is not going to be that bad for us considering that the rest of the meal is very healthy and it adds oodles of flavor I can't stress to you how much and also try to get your bacon smoked because the smoked does taste better to smoked tastes really nice with beans and now my cookers closed back up and my bacon's in there and we're getting ready to show you what happens in the last part which is where the meal comes together. See the star of the show, my Build-A-Bear retired seahorse and her little baby? And me. I look like I just got some bad news. Oh, I just got told to smile. Ha! <laughs> There's my chunked up potatoes back there, ready to be boiled. And they are covered with plenty of water. And you're going to turn that on to high because you're going to want to bring your potatoes to a boil as quickly as you can if you know you're trying to make your meal as quickly as you can <laughs> like I usually am hobbling off somewhere who the hell knows where I see I can got my skillet I've got my skillet there and it's probably got I would say a couple of tablespoons of oil in it liberally salt the potatoes before you boil them and yes you will need to probably add more salt 
after you've drained them and mashed them as well. Potatoes are very bland. Yes, I remember now that skillet's over there for my hoe cakes. And I have covered the bottom of the skillet with just plain old vegetable oil. I'm going to shallow fry the grits. I'm going to show you how to make grits. So that's how, that's this, this is what you do with the leftover grits. You take the cold leftover grits, shape them into patties, dip them in a bit of starch like cornstarch, flour, tapioca starch, and fry them, shallow fry them in some oil. And they made quite lovely corn cakes, hoe cakes, whatever the hell you want to call them. My left one on, and I'm, I think I'm jamming now to Diamond Nights or Madness or something like that. Anyway, on the left, you see my wok. And I'm going to fry my leeks and my cabbage in there. I think I probably have, dearie me, the karaoke tonight across the road. If y'all could only hear it. Whew. They must be pissed out of their heads. <laughs> it was fun. Anyway, there's a couple of tablespoons of Evu in there. And I'm just putting in my minced garlic now. I'm going to fry that till it's fragrant. That only takes one or two minutes. I have that heat on about medium. You don't want it too high because you're going to bring up smoke. You're going to burn your stuff. After that's fragrant, after a minute or so, you're going to put your leeks in. And you're just going to work them around. Get them coated in the oil. You can press at them like I am to kind of separate the rings. But you don't have to. Because uh, a lot of that's going to happen by, on its own. And you're just going to do your leeks for another couple minutes until you start seeing a bit of sear on them. Because you see my, my heat's going pretty good. It's medium to medium high there. Don't be afraid to put your heat up. And don't be afraid if you see a bit of scorching happening. A bit of brown like griddle marks on there. That's a good thing. That's a nutty, yummy flavor. I'm really getting down here. I don't know what the heck I'm listening to. But I must be enjoying it. Like I said, I do love my music while I'm cooking. Now I'm putting my cabbage ribbons in there. And it's going to look like a hell of a lot when I get it all in there. But it will wilt down. Cabbage has got a lot of moisture in it. And it will lose a lot of that moisture as we cook it. And not look so ginormous. It will probably, though, even if you are veggie lovers, leave some leftovers. Just heat them back up or eat them cold. They're still yummy. Liberally salt your cabbage now. This is going to do two things. Help the pathetically bland cabbage taste better. And help the cabbage to start breaking down, sweating, and getting into the groove with the cooking. Salt always does this. It begins the kind of a like, it's almost like a maceration process. And it, it, it helps the vegetables start to give up their juices and begin to cook better. I'm also liberally, whenever you're cooking cabbage where I come from, they use the crap out of the black pepper because cabbage and black pepper love each other like beans and rice. So yeah, be generous with the black pepper. Do not be afraid of the pepper. Now I'm just taking, I don't think I've put all the cabbage in yet because there's a hell of a lot of it. <laughs> but I'm just working the oil into the ribbons. And there's my hoe cakes or whatever they are. My little grit cake patties. And you see that they've been lightly starched. And that's all that's been done. I've shaped them into patties. Then I've lightly starched them with some tapioca starch. Like I said, you can use corn starch. You can use flour. And you're just going to like lay it in it and then turn it over so it gets some on both sides. And then that's just going into some inexpensive vegetable oil to shallow fry. And that's on about a, a medium heat. And it actually takes them quite a bit of time to cook. Now these grits, um, they do have some cheese in them and milk and water and salt and pepper. But that's about it. And they're going to be nice and crispy. But it takes them a while and we do shallow fry them. It takes them about 20 minutes, I would say, on the top and the bottom to get nice and golden brown for you. But it's really nice to be able to use all the grits if you don't eat them the first time. 
I'm seasoning them lightly there with the garlic powder granules and I'll do it with the salt and pepper as well because even though they have been previously seasoned I just said F it put some garlic powder in there too even though there's fresh garlic in there they taste different and it actually works quite well when you use both but hey I love garlic so it's up to your personal taste okay I think I've got all my cabbage in there now and it was a quite a bit of cabbage but like I said I really love my veg we all love it but especially me and you know you just work it around every couple of minutes and then you let it sit a couple of minutes don't turn it around too much or stir it constantly because you won't get any sear on it if you're doing that and you do want a bit of sear and I'm trying to show you here that when I'm finished it's not mushy it's still got a bit of bite but it is kind of tender and it does have a bit of scorch marks on it and that's a good thing and I'm gonna cover that and keep it warm now Paul's taking over from here because I think Paul is the mash master. So he's showing you that we got some garlic butter and I think that's been whipped. And all he's done at this point is taken his potatoes, drained them, and left them in. His method's different than mine and I think it's better than mine. And what he's doing is telling you do not put milk in it first. So he's actually a mash genius because I never knew that. And you can see that we have cooked the potatoes until they are quite tender. When you need to check them, and you co we cover them while we're cooking. When we get them up to a boil and, and they're bubbling away, we kind of switch that down to low and keep them covered. And we just let them bubble like that until they're fork tender. Until a fork just slides easily into it and it even breaks them apart. That's okay. Doesn't matter if they're really soft because that facilitates easy ma mashing for, for him. And it also means you don't have to use shit tons of butter and milk in there. I mean, there's no point in adding a ton of it when you don't need it. See, now he's putting a bit in and he's not going to... He doesn't put tons. He doesn't put loads. He puts a bit and then he works it in. See how he's kind of twisting his wrist, mashing and twisting, and you see how soft they look? They're gonna be incredibly creamy. He just has a way with mash, so I would follow Paul's method if I was you because he makes a damn good mash. At this point, he's adding just a touch more milk. It only looked like a tablespoon or two, so he doesn't use much. He uses less than me. And it appears that I'm pulling my hoe cakes out of the pan back there. They don't look very brown from here, but trust me, they're golden brown on both sides and they're crunchy on the outside. They did stay kind of creamy on the inside, being that they were grits prior to the process. But it was kind of an interesting contrast, texture contrast, and everybody really enjoyed it. And it was a great way to be able to use everything because one of the things like I might have told you before in this house is we try to waste as little as possible and when you have those grits topped with sausages and bell peppers and stuff look at that gorgeous mash god I'm away with myself blah -de -de blah blah see you can see that golden on my hoe cake and there's my beans can't expect me to eat beans Pfft. okay very steamy ha ha I'm just being lazy and laying the pot back and you can see the beans now are very tender and beautiful like I said the beans go about four to five hours on high and yes I am using Marmite and no no one will know what the hell it is put a heaping tablespoon like that or whatever they call it is it a dessert spoon I don't know Put a big spoonful like that in there, a heaping tablespoon, and stir it around till it's melted, and it will just give those beans a kick up the butt, and kapow is what they're going to taste like in your mouth. It's just gorgeous. But it's not a kapow like a kick in the mouth. It just really brings out the beans flavors, and no one would know. If you were not to tell them that you had Marmite in there, they wouldn't know. They just taste damn good. 
And believe me, it took a long time to discover all this crap, I'm telling you. <laughs> There's a, the last two hoe cakes over there going to town, sizzling in the pan. I don't waste anything. Now I'm covering them back up, and I'm going to set them to warm. There's the finished product going in my belly. Arr, 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 and I love you. And I send you sparkles and hamsters and rainbows. See you later on the flip side. Bye now.